Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Pat P, who is a technologist and a researcher at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he explores the intersection of synthetic virtual humans and synthetic biology, specifically at the interface between biological and digital systems. He's currently a PhD candidate in the Fluid Interfaces Research Group at MIT Media Lab, where he works with his collaborators at NASA, Entity Data, IBM, and Harvard to examine the future of human computer integration. His interdisciplinary research ranges from investigating AI generated characters for learning and well being, human AI co reasoning a wearable lab on the body with programmable bio-digital organ for space exploration, a machine learning model to detect linguistic markers related to mental health issues, and a mind-controlled 3D printer. So Pat, it's, it's a complete delight and honor to have you on the podcast. You have got your hands at the frontier, at the cutting edge of technologies. It'll be nice if you could go give a brief introduction on your background and what you've been doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, thanks for that long introduction. Um, I think it's a little overkill, but um, yeah. So right now, I'm a PhD student. Um, I, I really love dinosaur as a kid. So my work tend to sort of be at the intersection of biological thing, you know, like dinosaur and all these wonderful creature. And also like, you know, I, I love science fiction. So many of my work sort of are inspired by science fiction and the way that uh, we can think about the future of uh, the project that you mentioned, you know, uh, those are prototypes that we have been developing at the lab. Um, they are still uh, in the preliminary phase, um, but it showed a new possibility for the future. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, a my control 3D printer. That one we explore, you know, when brain computer interface become ubiquitous and connect with, you know, different kind of thing like, you know, 3D printer. Now we can 3D print food based on your emotion at the moment, right? So that's one project. Another one that you mentioned, um, the uh, uh, synthetic virtual human. That's actually the work that I'm focusing on right now at MIT Media Lab. Uh, we, you know, really explore um, the idea of human AI intersection. Um, what happened when we can create a virtual clone of someone? You know, it could be virtual clone of ourselves, maybe from the future, so we can have the conversation with and and learn uh, a better. Right, so that's been uh, uh, the primary uh, focus of my research, and it's always about you know bio becoming digital, uh, in the sense that we uh, you know be able to program a biological system, um, and then digital being become biology, where we can use digital system to recreate the human body, um, and recreate uh, a, you know uh, us into a virtual character. So that's uh, what I mean by bio becoming digital and digital becoming biology. At MIT Media Lab, uh, we you know really explore um, the idea of human AI intersection um what happened when we can create a virtual clone of someone you know it could be virtual clone of ourselves maybe from the future so we can have the conversation with and, and learn uh, a better right so that's been uh, uh, the primary uh, focus of my research and it's always about you know bio becoming digital uh, in the sense that we uh, you know be able to program a biological system um, and then digital being become biology where we can use digital system to recreate the human body um, and recreate uh, a, you know uh, us into a virtual character so that's uh, what i mean by bio becoming digital and digital becoming biology lovely how cool is that you you mentioned uh, you 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 have been really i mean you really like dinosaurs and and, and yeah. that's that's something which my son i mean he he loves dinosaurs and he always questions me about indominus rex that is yeah. it possible <laughs> yeah. could we someday yeah. be able to genetically you know design uh, the these yeah. uh, or bring back uh, the these uh, dinosaurs and, and these conversations are now like you said going from science fiction to science fact uh, right. george church is working on yes. at least thinking about you know constructively how we can bring back uh, the woolly mammoth yeah. and and so so exciting conversations and you rightfully pointed out i, I think uh, science fiction is fast becoming science fact and right. i think uh, world leaders organizations nations academia should join hands and and work together 
to build technology which is human first because i i, I think so far the, the technology i think neither google neither facebook Right, that's a great question. So um, before before that, I wanna sort of echo what your what your son was asking, right? I think that's a really fascinating question. I also watched Jurassic Park when I was a kid as well, so I I really uh, admire that. Um, yeah, I, I think the conversation about genetic engineering and and right now we call it synthetic biology, right, has evolved a lot since the beginning of the field, and now um you know people like George Church, who's actually on my uh, uh master thesis committee, um you know is at the forefront of like trying to think about what can we engineer and not just about what we can but should we do it you know like um, the question about uh, bringing back the woolly mammoth is i think is, is, it has gained a lot of controversy because of the application and also um you know the ethics uh, around bringing back um, historical uh, uh, creatures from the past right so i think the conversation definitely like you know it's multi it's multi but dimensional it's not just about technology or, or, or alone but it's also like the environmental consequence and the the social impact as well um and uh, uh yeah and, and i think right now as you said right uh, many of the science te te many of the um technology we see in science fiction is becoming reality which is in a way a, a great thing right that we are exciting and then we are like moving forward into the future but as you know right many of these technology that were um presented in science fiction were presented as like a cautionary tale right it's like something to warn us that if you keep pushing it's going to break you it's going to break society it's going to have like tremendous impact not just positive but negative one on society so um i think you know we should not just like march towards science fiction because many science fiction end with like disaster or um, um apocalypse right but we can learn from that lesson and see what kind of technology are actually um could be potentially beneficial for for human being um right and and when you talk about bio and digital right there are many science fiction that talk about this like you know there's a like a vision like in avatar right where you have like very sophisticated technology and sophisticated you know uh, alien species that learn to live in nature right they have like this really powerful um, brain computer interface or brain to environment interface that allow them to connect with other species. I think that's a very uh, a powerful vision that we can strive forward, right? But that could also be another vision like alien, for example, that's also like bio and digital coming together, right? It's like a half robot, half organism. That's very powerful, very dangerous, right? So we should not create alien, we should create like something more like avatar, um, or now we people, right? So I think in, in even science fiction alone, there are vision that we can imitate and and something that we should be careful of and and avoid. Um, and to unpack the term biodigital a little bit more, um, I think when you think of biological system, right, you think of things that evolve for a long period of time, like things that can grow organically, biological system, like bacteria cell, human organs, plants, living trees, things like that. Right, these are in a way um um timeless in the sense that they are um you know some of the organisms like cockroach have been around since the, the the time of dinosaur right but the evolution and the the adaptability of this biological system allow it to continue to survive and right now we start to learn how to harness this power right when we produce um vaccine or when we learn to uh, genetic engineer a uh, different kind of organism from yeast to bacteria um to even more sophisticated organism like plant to produce like all kind of biological logics right we start to be able to tap into this power of biology um, but digital system on the other hand they are very in a way very timely they are very quick but it doesn't last very long like you know the iphone right now the short span is you know shorter than a cockroach right um biological system evolved for a longer period of time than digital system have ever been on earth right so digital system is, is powerful you can program it it's much uh, 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 more um, uh, fast and and it can you know do things in a very quickly uh, a way, but it doesn't it doesn't evolve. Um, right now we have machine learning, but that is an in imitation of biological system as well, right? But the the digital system itself is very rigid. It doesn't it doesn't evolve and um. Yeah, so if you think about how do you bring the best of both worlds together to create some kind of technology that can do things that biology can, making molecule at some nano and, and molecular scale. But with the digital with, with the digital computational uh, capability of the digital system, then you can really create this sort of hybrid biodigital system that can be really powerful for the future. And the application of these, you know, range from like healthcare. If you can digitally design medicine molecule and be able to produce it and execute it like biological system can do, that would be incredible, right? Or material and sustainability, if you can, you know, uh, make solar cell in a way that plant 
you know, do photosynthesis, right? You will be able to eliminate many waste, electronic waste, and be able to do something that are much more sustainable, right? So bringing bio and digital together will bring the best of both worlds and create a new paradigm that we've never seen before. Yeah. Are, I think challenging uh, how we have designed systems so far, and, and we are asking deeper questions of, can we use biology itself to design the, the future? And it, it, it's really interesting. And I think you pointed out something very interesting. I think the future that we design, you know, we, we could possibly emulate what, you know, uh, what was show, shown by James Cameron in, in mm -hmm. Avatar, the Navi people, you know, having that little uh, a convergence with you know the nature environment itself because i i think we we in or or agree uh or agree to just uh consume uh you know create things we, we are consuming things senselessly without any conservation which which is taking us to uh a, a, a future which could not be so nice uh, to humanity I, I was watching one of your video where you were you mentioned about bio design and there are there, there are people uh, like uh, brian johnson with colonel uh, uh, ginkgo who are looking at mm -hmm. creating uh, with with the tool uh, 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 leveraging in, in biology you know taking trees and creating things w would you like to talk a little bit about that yeah so i think the discipline of synthetic biology or biodesign have evolved um uh, recently right um and what is really fascinating about this discipline is that it um it's built on top of the design process or the engineering process right in the past if you think about growing an organism in the wet lab Right, you think about like you know how would you grow something? It's more organic. It's more maybe closer to agriculture, right? Um, but now with the discipline of of synthetic biology and biodesign, I think the 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 practice has become more like engineer of an engineering process where you think about okay, what you're gonna make, what part can you assembly, and then you can decide and you test it, and then you go back to 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 design again. So it's like this engineering cycle process where you can actually. Um, think of organism as like little machine built from um, um organic and, and biological part like DNA genes uh, and things like that and now we have like many, very sophisticated machine learning that allow us to think about how different you know piece of the gene can fit together and be able to allow us to uh, create new functionality like produce new enzyme that never that never occur in in, in nature or um you know develop new type of medicine that haven't been uh, uh produced uh, uh before right so this process of assembling um biological parts some are found in nature some are completely synthetic allow us to design organism in a new way ways that we never imagined before and what is fascinating about ginkgo biowork which is a spin off from MIT right is that they were able to do this at scale in a high throughput manner in a way that you know you manufacture car or computer chip where you do multiple at the same time right now uh, a biological process you know has been automated in that sense that you have robot to do this experiment you know screening for genes that can be used for and then uh, have machine learning to figure out whether this can connect with that or not right and have like a, a new robust organism that you can deploy and test at scale so I think this is the, the 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 thing that is emerging in in this area, and it's not just happening in the industry, right? There are um this kind of of technology are becoming more accessible. People in like DIY biology community, you know, people that you know uh, call themselves like a biohacker or a or, or, or community biologist, right? Start to use the same technology for doing different things for uh, their community, right? People using synthetic biology to monitor the environment, to create artistic project, um, you know, and, and you know, th this practice is becoming more accessible than ever. You can buy, um, you know, a test kit or um, even a design kit to, to do something with CRISPR um, online. Like you can buy like a DIY CRISPR engineering kit and now you can engineer bacteria at home. Right, a, 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 you know, CRISPR won Nobel Prize. Um, now that technology is is in your hand in a way, right? And and you know, we need to think a lot about the the, the regulation and ethic as well. But I think right now the technology is really democratized. Um, here at the Media Lab, we also teach a class called How to Grow Almost Anything, where we teach this technique, this uh, method of engineering and, and designing with biology, with non-biologist people, right? We teach it to artists, auto engineers, uh, from auto discipline designer, but business uh, people, artists, and, and everyone, right? So that, you know, these become like a building block. You can compare it to like the beginning of 
a personal computer, right? Where computer is not about a scientific computation or business anymore. It's about anything, right? We use computer for all kind of application now. Biology will be the same in the sense that you can engineer biology for any kind of application, not just healthcare or 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 um or. or agriculture, but for art, for entertainment, for design, for architecture, for all kinds of application. Um, this idea of biodesign and synthetic biology will open up the world of biology in that way. How cool is that? You know, I, I think uh, what what's happening is, is this this democratization of knowledge, accessibility of knowledge, you know, through the forms of not just, you know, the MITs, you know, we have these MOOCs, massive open online courses. And you also mentioned yeah. that there are these you know, biohackers who are, you know, you know ha- you're selling these yeah. you know, you know, CRISPR kits. And, and yes, obviously, the, 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 the pros are that, you know, it, there's a larger number of people who are who are understanding the knowledge and are tinkering around with the source code of life and trying to you know design leveraging biology so a it's extremely interesting b is you know if it goes into the fringe elements i mean you know we could have somebody you know designing a novel virus you know so 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 those are the conversations i i think you know we need to kind of uh, uh, you know consider and and make sure that there's some kind of a regulatory framework over there but i i i i think the the fox is in the house of the end it's already out i i mean so i i don't know how we we, we can kind of like uh, deal with it but i hope that we have larger conversations into creating a future which is really human first now you're part of the fluid interface research group at mit lab and, and yep. you mentioned about all those uh, pro- products prototypes that you build and it's not just pro- uh, products these, these are prototypes w- would you like to talk about some of your uh, uh, work and, yeah. and and by when do you think those products that you are talking which could be those first products which could be uh, market ready uh the group that i'm part of is called fluid interface so uh, people always think of like you know liquid or water but when we talk about fluid interface we are thinking about um fluid integration between human and technology and uh, a human and machine right and and we want to create this kind of seamless in, uh, coupling between the two um not because you know we want to become more machine but because we want the machine to sort of help us become more human than ever you know we, we always say that we are the one that create cyborg right and i think you know cyborg is a very powerful term um i, I love this term a lot and it's actually rooted in a scientific uh, 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 research before it entered the mainstream science fiction um you know manfred klein and nathan klein who coined the term cyborg once said that um you know the goal of cyborg is not to become a robot but to be more human than ever and we use technology to get rid of the mundane and the repetitive tasks that human need to do right and use technology to do it instead so that we are free free to explore to think to create and to you know be more human, right? And I think that's the goal of our group is to use technology to augment our capability, not replace human capability. And um, yeah, so there are many projects in our group that you know span across different domain. Um, Professor Paddy Mars, who's an incredible mentor of mine and or the, the leader of Fluid Interface, you know, had this you know, strong vision of using technology to enhance our, our you know, human cognitive capabilities, right, across a across, uh, 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 domain from creativity, increasing attention, learning, health, and so on, right? So the project that I mentioned about, like, um, um, uh, integrating bio and digital together, that's just one area of, of the a larger vision of the Fluid Interfaces group. So um, in, in my in my, in my research, research um, in particular, uh, I work on um, how do we integrate sort of biological system into digital system, right? Like uh, especially um, the pro- project that you mentioned earlier, uh, biodigital organ, we try to make um, technology on the human body like an organ, you know, an organ is something that always, you know, always working. You don't need to check on it. You don't need to check that your heart is beating or not, right? It's happening organically. It's very seamless. And it had like, you know, a, a, a sort of understanding of your body. Like your heart will beat faster if you are exercising or do something that really need a lot of energy, right? So we build a lot of technology that, you know, based on that principle. So we have a project where we work with NASA Trish, uh, which is an organization in NASA that deal with uh, space health. How do we ensure um, astronaut health as, as they travel into space, right? So we work on developing a um, biodigital organ to allow astronaut to be able to stay healthy in space. Yeah. 
So that is about how do we integrate biology into digital system. And then on the other hand, I work a lot with this idea of, um, you know, uh, playing with the code of life, right, as you mentioned, but translate this code of life into a digital code of life, where we create a re realistic AI generated character. So using AI to create a virtual clone of ourselves um, for a multiple application for learning, for health, for decision making and so on. You know, if you have an ability to talk to your future, right, we can clone you and make you look older or, you know, use the data that you have now and uh, allow you to actually talk to maybe your future self, maybe 10 or 20 years ago into the future. What question would you do? It's like time travel to meet your future self, right? So that is another area that we really push the limit of biology using AI, um, creating sort of new interaction that can never happen because right now we don't have time machine. Right. But we can simulate that interaction with technology. Um, and, you know, at the end, it's not about making cool technology. It's about how this technology really empower and, and enhance human. That's really important. Right. Um, you know, many tech company right now, they're making, you know, better, cooler, faster technology. But it leaves behind the human, you know, the, the human quality. Right. Even though they claim that, oh, this human centric, but at the end, it's always profit centric. So what we try to do here, we, you know, at, at, as academic uh, research institute, we are sort of more neutral in the sense that we can explore more crazy ideas. And, um, you know, we, we're not afraid to say that, well, some, some technology that we build, you know, have negative consequence on people. You know, we can learn from that and decide better technology, right? I think that's the role of academic research that we can, you know, be brave and 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 and, and sort of, you know, not uh, uh, depending on just, you know, uh, uh, the the customer or, or the, the profit stability, but more on, you know, curiosity and, you know, thinking about what is actually good for humanity. I think that's the goal of, of uh, research that we do here at MIT, yeah. Right, yeah, I think, yes, I mean, that should be the goal because, yes, so far, uh, 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 the way we have built businesses is, is largely mm -hmm. underpinned on, on the capitalistic uh, framework. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's profit at, at any cost. But but I, I think you know we, there, there's this exciting movement. You know, the, the new mm -hmm. thing with that we're talking about. You know, at the at least the the web trio and, and yeah. the metaverse. You know, I mean the conversation at least around that uh, mm -hmm. with, with the front movers is, is you know the the it, it's going to be uh, underpinned by decentralization, interoperability, openness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little little fancy and it's it's idealistic and seems to be a way out. But at that, there's one side of me who's very hopeful that we transition to to this this kind of a world because so far the entire world is so so unequal you know i, I think around roughly around four four or five percent of uh, right. uh, of the entire po population is they are the ones who own the 99 percent of the entire uh, global mm -hmm. wealth and and there needs to be a change you know that the, the wealth needs to be more distributed Edu education should be more accessible and, and should be democratized mm -hmm. and there are entrepreneurs you know who are asking deeper and braver questions and saying can we correct the wrongs you know and can we build a a, a world that this new world with uh, that we're talking about uh, underpinning th these technologies or uh, right. powerful technologies of web3 blockchain transparency so so we right. we, 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 we getting into an exciting space and you also yeah. men mentioned something important which i think i would I like to highlight over there you said sometimes cyborgs are, are more human and, and that whole question of uh, us you know we, we, we say that we are biological but some sometimes I, I ask this question are we truly biological uh, or are we uh, a, a convergence of biological and digital because our entire body functions because of trillions of, of cells powered by electricity and so does mm. our brain our brain with, with our 70 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses it, it, it's powered by electricity uh, electricity it, it, it's these electrical signals w w which are firing us so at the core how much are we biological i mean that that that's a question which which keeps me a little listening so uh, yeah, can, uh -huh. can, can, can you talk about you know the, the wearable ai for enhancing human re reason and decision making yeah. wearable reasoner which uh, yeah. which was currently being exhibited at, at the mit museum 
Yes, definitely. So yeah, I think the question that you raised are really important and something that we all need to think about, right? Um, how do we, you know, uh, uh, correct some of the sort of uh, uh, um, earlier mistake that we made in the digital era, right? I mean, um, you know, when, when in, in the beginning of, of the internet, right, we had like fewer data point and, and, you know, people were excited about like, you know, the connection between, you know, human and human across continent, across the world, right? And, and there are many hope and dreams about the early day of internet, right? And now we know that many of the technology that we develop based on that internet are making people become more addicted to the technology or become short-sighted because because um uh they are you know uh uh um uh, because technology is designed to sort of engage and and steal our attention all the time right so um we start to learn this sort of phenomena that happen um and one of which is like um also about fake news right right now we have many uh, false information then you know any time in human history, you can generate fake news very easily now. You have AI that can say, okay, write fake news about this, and it will generate thousands and even millions of texts um, in a very short period of time, right? We have machines that can, you know, create propaganda and, and uh, uh, talk about um, um, anything uh, right now, like, you know, the last language model like GPT-3 or um, um, Lambda or, or this large language model, it can be prone um, to generating false information, right? So I think, you know, now that we learn all these things, we should think about ways that we can sort of, you know, help people and 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 augment our capability to discern uh, false information from true information, and more importantly, logical and 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 re you know reasonable information from reason from information that are you know uh, 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 manipulative, right? So uh, one of the projects that we explore is called Variable Reasoner, uh, the one that you mentioned, uh, where we try to think about. AI as a second brain. So, you know, you can think of it as like, you know, the war between AI, right? There's an AI that try to manipulate and generate false information. And we try to build, you know, good AI that help us think better, become more reasonable and, and you know, look at logic and, and logical connection between statements before we believe or, or make decision on them. So uh, in that project, we demonstrate the ability to embed um, this sort of AI that can sort of look at the statement and be able to discern uh, whether the statement is reasonable or not by looking at the linguistic structure and looking at sort of the morphology of the sentence and be able to give feedback to the user. One thing that we find uh, very interesting is that if the AI just tell the user that, oh, this is unreasonable or this is um, you know lacking evidence, people actually doesn't, you know, do anything about it. They just, you know, continue with their day. They're like, okay, whatever the AI say. But if the AI can tell the user, you know, with evidence or give a, a reasoning process why certain thing is reasonable or why certain thing is not reasonable, then people tend to be able to sort of uh, or be able to internalize that knowledge and make better decision. This is really important because as you think about making AI that's better, smarter, clever, you also need to think about ways that it interface with people. It's not just about you put the AI in front of human and then human will learn how to use it right away. Most of the time, humans just ignore the decision by AI or ignore the feedback from AI or the opposite, they completely go with the AI, even though when the AI make the mistake, right? You want to engineer um, an effective communication between the two. That's why there is a new discipline called human AI interaction that really focus on how do we interact with AI in the ways that it support us and, and, and enhance us rather than sort of suppress our cognitive capability. So um, that project have demonstrated that when the AI is explainable, um, when it is uh, be able to sort of you know open its black box and tell the user a little bit what uh, what it see in the information that make it make that certain decision, it tend to be able to lead to sort of better outcome in terms of decision making. So that isn't one example of what how we think about human AI symbiosis where one uh, uh, is supporting one another, right? And and uh, uh, right as you said, right now this project is being exhibited at the MIT Museum right now. Uh, we have a very beautiful museum that's just open, actually uh, not uh, long ago, actually two to three weeks ago, actually um, at, at MIT. So uh, when you come visit, uh, feel free to check it out. Um, it's in the exhibit called um, AI Mind the Gap, uh, which is a, 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 a beautiful exhibit about the history of AI at MIT. 
I would like to talk a little bit about MIT. You know, MIT is the mecca, you know, in the world where, you know, all the cutting edge of innovation happens over there. I mean, you know, that's the, the breeding ground of, uh, I think, the most bravest and uh, I, I think it's the culture where you are pushed to ask like really out there brave questions which which is which i think doesn't happen in india and i hope that you know I, I, india uh, you know emulates that model where we kind of push the students the entrepreneurs to ask these like really brave deep out uh, questions even if you, you know it you might look stupid but because i, I think you know when when you ask these like really brave questions that's when you you kind of break the uh, you know the, that okay the the barriers of what you you term as impossible and you know then everything starts becoming you know possible uh would, would you like to talk a little bit about mit would you like to talk about yeah. uh, people you are inspired who you look up to and some some of the innovations that crazy innovation that you've seen or been part of which has blown your mind um, yeah, so that's that's a great question. So, um, you know, I'm from Thailand myself, so I totally understand, you know, in Thailand, people are also um, not as uh, uh, open to crazy ideas. And, and, you know, that's one thing that I also try to encourage, um, you know, people in, in Asia and in Southeast Asia in particular also. Um, I think MIT is 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 a, is a wonderful place. Um, you know, it's uh, it's you know, uh, it's a magnet that bring all the amazing people from around the world. Um, people that are you know brave and crazy and think about you know things that no one thought about. And more importantly, they not just think about things, but they um, you know, uh, the MIT has a, a a philosophy like hand and mind. So you think you have your mind, you you have the capability to imagine new possibility. But the most important thing is not just to think, is to actually exp experiment and, and execute and, and make something, right? So hand and mind need to come together and and and, and yeah. So I think that's uh, what I've seen here at MIT, which is the, the, the spirit and the culture of people that are not just pushing the boundary in terms of idea, but are making something really cool and inspiring to the world. Um, often we think that the work that we do sort of, you know, precede um, or or happen before um, the world is ready, right? Like uh, the Media Lab has invented touchscreen maybe 30 years before Apple started to, to do it in iPad or iPhone, right? Or like GPS or, or you know, um, computer aid design and many of the wonderful technology that came out of the lab um, has been around uh, at the lab for, for many years before it uh, started to become mainstream. And that, I think, what the area that we thrive on is to work on the future, um, not just, you know, get stuck by the customer and what is, you know, being accepted at the moment, but think about what would be something that would be powerful and, and impactful for human in the long run. And I think that's uh, the role of the, the of the academia, right? Like if we are doing the same thing as, you know, company, then why why are we in university, right? Like we need to think beyond that and, and not be bounded by what is profitable. Um, though we collaborate with uh, industry, right? Because we also want to help people. And, you know, many, many, many times, uh, many companies that are doing really well, they are make some product that are very impactful to human life, right? So we collaborate with them and we, you know, get their feedback and, and work with them also, right? So I think it's a really powerful idea that we um, be able to sort of, you know, listen to the industry, work with the industry, but not uh, be bounded by the industry. I think that's uh, the magic here. And um, I think another thing that is powerful about MIT is that it is very interdisciplinary. Here we see, you know, artists, designers, scientists, engineers working side by side, right? So it's not silos into, you know, each discipline or it's not silo into each department, but it's people that have, you know, share vision for the future. We have different imagination, but we are bounded by, you know, certain idea that we want to push and, and explore together. And that really create the momentum and inspire and inspiration that you know uh, uh, circulate between uh, one another and help um, um, this place sort of build something that that is revolutionary time after time. And you know, actually, uh, uh, we also have many um, people from India that came also like have many colleagues from India also, and I really uh, uh, admire them. They are really incredible. Um, and and yeah, I think you know. Hopefully, um, this idea will also translate back to to India also, and and make you know India and auto country in Asia, uh, have this kind of uh, uh impact driven and and futuristic vision driven um, um research. I think that would be best best for the whole world. 
so pat uh, you also have been working on something called wearable lab on body mm-hmm. would you like to talk a little bit about that yeah so um that project as i mentioned earlier is a project that we work with um nasa trish where we explore um ways in which we can design sort of um organ you know space organ for the astronaut and this is in a way um sort of echoing um the idea of cyborg um, as i mentioned earlier the term cyborg was actually created um, before before Apollo 11 uh, about, you know, uh, how do we uh, sort of go into space instead of like changing the environment around us. We can change ourselves so that we can be, you know, a better suit for, for the extreme environment of space. Right. So um, in a way, the idea of cyborg has always been in, uh, interconnected with the space exploration. So in the in the wearable bio um uh, project in the wearable lab on a body project, we sort of look at ways in which uh, we can design these sort of you know biological organ system that can sense information from the body. So the device clip to the mouth and constantly taking saliva and you know be able to place saliva on you know existing uh, sensor that can monitor different kind of um, biomarkers in saliva. So we build this sort of bridge between um, the biofluid that contain all kind of bio- biomolecular um, information with sensor that can sort of, you know, look at this uh, continuously and in real time. So astronaut can have like full access to their um, uh, body information. And then uh, that's, you know, half of the process, right? So if you can have the information to the body, but you cannot do anything about it, then why having it in the first place? We want to be able to do intervention on the human body as well. So uh, we build another system that sort of look at the information from the body and then be able to intervene by producing uh, molecules uh, like, you know, medicine in response to uh, the human condition. And then we can do it um, um, on the human body itself. So allowing the astronaut um, a spacesuit to not just become like, you know, the the protective layer for the astronaut, but it's actually um, like a a pharmaceutical, um, uh, like a wearable pharmaceutical uh, uh, manufacturing system on the astronaut itself. So creating this kind of closed loop system where we can sense um, health information from astronaut and then be able to produce health intervention on the human body. And this is still um, um, an ongoing research that we have been developing. We have you know, present different version of these through different iteration, but it's a really interesting and exciting uh, era where we can think about biodigital, not just um, on the scale of, of uh, in the lab scale, but on the human scale itself, which is really fascinating. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Really appreciate you taking time, being part of the podcast and sharing your insights. Uh, you are at the cutting edge of technology, you know, both with biology and, uh, you know, with AI and things like that. So uh, exciting time, exciting space. Wish, wish you the very best. My last question to you. If you had to paint a picture of what the world could look like in in another 10 years what would you have mm-hmm. to say and and, uh, and uh, why why while you are painting a picture of what the world could look like in in, in your in, in the next 10 years also maybe share your moonshot so i think that there could be three pictures depending on how the world go right so one would be um the world where technology augment human capability right this is something that we are working toward where you know instead of you know people being afraid of ai taking over their job is ai augmenting that job or ai creating new jobs that haven't been done before right and this could lead to you know a society where you know we become uh, uh, augmented and we can do more with you know less time and we can do things that are more expressive creative and and um sort of uh, something that's more humanistic um than doing sort of the mundane and routine and repetitive ta- task that would be something that a machine can do for us leaving us free to be more human that's one you know vision for the future another vision is that if that doesn't happen and people you know doesn't really think about ai as augmentation then you know we will see a society where you know we start to see ai replacing some of the job and that you know we create a sort of high inequality uh, where you know people um who you know who who doesn't have sort of technological uh, uh, capability will, you know, will will lose the job to AI. They need to do more mundane thing because AI is going to do more advanced and creative thing, right? Um, we already seen AI, you know, making picture and paint things, right, in a way that is is really beautiful. Um, and you know, even winning like art awards, right, like you know, Mid Journey or Dali and all these beautiful and stable diffusion. These are like, you know, uh, our text to image model are very beautiful and uh, amazing, right? So we might see um, that sort of thing happening where people are losing their job, even people that are doing creative thing, losing their job to AI that are doing creative work, right? And that inequality will be wider. 
the third picture that I think is the most realistic one is that it's the combination of the first two, right? The first one is more um, utopia. We have the AI augmenting people and, you know, we all have, you know, wonderful time. We become human and and maybe, you know, we don't need to work as hard as AI is augmenting us. And uh, uh, the more dystopian version where the AI is replacing some of, you know, people and, and job, right? So I think the third, uh, the third picture is that it's a combination of the two. The question is, which one is more dominant? And I think this is a question that each country and each, uh, you know, region need to, to think for themselves, right? How do we make sure that we are moving to the work toward the area where the AI is empowering citizen rather than the, the uh, 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 repressing the citizen? And I think the third vision, um, you know, the, the, the hybrid, the, the, the more realistic, the pragmatic wheel, that's something that that I think we will see, um, but each country might vary in terms of which one is more dominating, the, the utopia or the dystopia one. Um, and I think the moonshot, definitely, and I think it has been for uh, many years now, is to always think about um, human in the loop, right? And I think uh, more and more people are thinking about this, but not just about, um, um, you know, uh, uh, putting like you know, sticking AI on top of human and like, okay, let's think about ways that we can make it flow seamlessly together. But thinking about human from the ground up, thinking about human psychology, cognitive processes, and how do we design something that, you know, really empower people, not just making them more efficient or more creative, but empower their sort of spirit and 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 um sort of you know the inner motivation and and you know celebrating uh, the human life. I think that's um the moonshot. It's very simple, but it's very deep and philosophical. That's why we need uh, people from all disciplines to sort of join force in this future. Thank you. I think you rightfully pointed out. I think the larger conversations needs to be around creating that human machine partnership because the growth of technology is inevitable it, it's the tech has always been augmenting mankind right from you know the first tool from fire to you mm -hmm. know today mm -hmm. your stable diffusion which is kind of democratized uh, access of, of, of the, the these tools of ai and i was on the hope right. of thinking you know it could be maybe the google or the meta uh, who would kind of you know democratize ai and here comes uh, 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 an entrepreneur who has kind of democratized um, ai and we we can and, and it, it's also kind of uh, you know pushed to that that the conversation which we held that oh AI will not touch creativity and, and right. here we here we are po poking that and it, it, it's I I, I I I just keep on thinking what happens ten years down the line when mm -hmm. when when the, these tools mature so I it, it's so pertinent that a technologist. Uh, academia, government, investors, all the stakeholders, including the, the the citizens, the end users, consumers of the product, joins hand uh, and have conversations. Bring the high level conversation of AI uh, genetics to you know make it accessible so everybody can participate. And I guess that's the only way we can create technology which is human first otherwise we'll all be ending up creating ai with our own biases and, yeah. and, and, and you know so so i really hope that we uh, go towards the space where technology is, is always human first is, is there any last notes that you would want to uh, uh, add add on uh, no, I think what you what you you mentioned is is you know perfectly summarized what we talk about. I think it's really important that we you know make people aware of the emerging tech that's happening, but more importantly, empowering them to you know be able to you know voice um, you know their their hope and dream and concern because you know um, human shape technology and technology shape human, right? So we want people um, at the at the forefront of these. We don't want technology to dominate our life. We can create technology in the human value. I think that's the most important thing, um, and and that's why we need. As I said, I, I said many times, we need interdisciplinary approach to this. Um, we want humanists, technologists, designer, philosopher, artist, designer, everyone had a role to play in our future. I think that's the most important message. Um, yeah. Perfect. That, thank you, Pat. Uh, a good, great note to end on. To my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Bye -bye. Thank you, Pat. Really appreciate this. Thank you.